So, St. Paul water is pretty soft, pretty low mineral content, because we want this to taste bitter. Not hoppy, but bitter, because it's a bitter, a boat bitter. We're gonna Burtonize the St. Paul water with some sulfate, calcium, and a little bit of magnesium. So that was gypsum, calcium sulfate, and there's a dough ball. Smash. And Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate, to give kind of a minerally, to me it's almost a flinty flavor in the finished beer. It's really going to accentuate the hops. Should help our mash pH too. You little bastard. For anybody that doesn't know, why do you want to make sure you smash up those dough balls? Because you could have on hydrolyzed starches and enzymes at the center of that, that dough ball. It's just like when you're making pancake dough, pancake batter. You want to get all the get all the lumps out. Get that get it mixed up nice and evenly. You could have incomplete conversion, wasted potential. I'm gonna heat it to mash out. These dogs don't agree with me, but I find it helps my efficiency. It's just one way to do things. No right or wrong. Who are we to judge? What does a mash just out gonna... do? Does it kind of like just cut off the process? Yeah. Yeah, it does a few things. Number one, it... Uh, makes the starches, or sugars I should say, it makes the sugars that we've created in the mash a little more soluble, hotter temperature, things are runnier, if you want to think of it that way, so it's easier to rinse them out of the solid matter left in the mash tun. So that's where that little efficiency boost comes in. Uh, the other thing it'll do is it'll fix the fermentability of the wort. You'll, you'll denature the amylolytic enzymes and stop any more conversion in the mash once you heat it up to about 168, 170. So that way you won't over attenuate your beer if you just kind of let it. The theory is that if you just let the mash go and go and go and go, those Longer chain sugars would just keep getting broken down into smaller and smaller, more easily fermentable, uh, simple sugars, and you'd have an over attenuated, thin bodied beer. In practice, I don't know how much that actually happens on a five gallon scale, but that's, that's the theory anyway. How's it taste, Chip? Salty. That's from our, our uh, salt additions. And what does that do? Why does that allow bitterness to pop out, to stand out? It's, yeah, the, uh, the effect of um, sulfate, especially, and I think, I think also magnesium, but I gotta, I gotta fact check that. Definitely sulfate, high sulfate water, like the kind you find in Burton or Dortmund, Germany, are really good at enhancing bitterness and that's why the beers from those two towns were historically known for being hoppy. That is pretty salty. You gotta remember that's getting diluted two to one with sparge water. There were no salt additions to the sparge, just to the mash. I can remember years and years ago when you used to be able to get Marston's Pedigree Bitter here in the Twin Cities, that it had that, I think of it as minerally or flinty, kind of like a rocky, sedimentary uh, edge to it, but salty, right? And it was just, it was delicious, it was wonderful. It also gave this kind of uh, almost lagery, sulfurous quality to the, to the water and to the beer. It was just so nice in a pale, hoppy, crisp beer. And that's, that's exactly what I'm after. Three and a half percent, 
behaving for the police stationed at boat landings near the riverfront watching for perverts. <laughs> My buddy who built the boat is actually really getting into low gravity British beers right now and I've been turning him on to well, as much as, as low gravity as they are for the export market, right? Like the uh, Tim Taylor's Landlord and Fuller's London Pride and beers like that. And he's really getting into it. And he came across a mention of Marston's in Michael Jackson. He can't get it anymore. It's not, not distributed here. Maybe not even distributed in the U.S., but it's eating him up. And I've got a solution for him. And then he can row me down the river. It's... What's going on with that tripod? That tripod? Yeah. It's like, where's Waldo? <laughs> this dude doing a podcast was back there. But I guess he left. I don't know. Have you heard of Chop and Brew? It's sweet. For a small beer like this, um, you need to be careful about over sparging if you fly sparge or batch sparge. If you brew in a bag, it's all out the window, right? right. But you don't want to sparge past, say, a specific gravity of 10.08, give or take, just to hit your kettle volume. You're better off cutting the sparge once the runnings hit that point, and then topping up the kettle with water if you're still short on volume. Or start with a little bit thinner mash so you can get by yeah. with less sparge water. What do you think of the 1026? That's the what I was going to ask you. What, um, I'm, I'm not really always that good at deciphering what part yeast is playing still mm -hmm. in a lot of beers. If it's a Belgian or a German mm -hmm. Hef yeast, yeah, you know what you're looking for. I do feel like if the if that dryness and that kind of highlighting of the hops and that kind of kind of not allowing the buildup of sweetness, if all of those are components of that yeast, I like that yeast. Mm -hmm. I would like to see, like I said just a second ago, I'd like to see that yeast put through its trials on something American, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I bet that would be good, especially with some earthier hops. Maybe less citrusy. Okay. More earthy. Such as? Willamette okay. would be good. Mount Hood? Mount Hood could be good. Uh, Sterling? Sterling. Sterling the, might the be original. nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's been a while since I used this yeast. Like I mentioned last week, it's been a while since it was on release, so I kind of had to refresh my memory, and I feel like I need to qualify something I said on brew night when I said this was a fruity yeast. Mm -hmm. It's not a Belgian. You know what I mean? It's not a Hefeweizen yeast. Yeah. And it's more, that fruitiness is more of like the Whitbread school of English yeast, where it's a little tart, it tends toward the dry, it doesn't play up the malt or the caramel component as much as some of the London strains do. Okay. I see some of the other, like, you know, traditional bitter strains. It ties into like the musty apricot you're talking about. Yeah, a little bit. Country yeah. peach. Yeah, it's still got some esters, but they're they're not out of control. You know, I think it's kind of like a little white grape or maybe a little acetylaldehyde, a little green apple in there. But not overpowering, and it, it plays up the malt, too. It does a nice job. That yeastiness, that freshness, goes really well with the doughiness and biscuity character of the Warminster Maris Otter. We, uh, because of the hot weather we've been having, mm -hmm. I couldn't chill this wort quite as cold as I wanted. The fermentation started at 68, rose up to about 72 to 73, but it never really got out of control, estery, phenolic, fusilli. So that was good. Mm -hmm. That was good. At 24 hours, it was at high croissant. After 40 hours past pitching, the off gas was done in the airlock. Three days, it was within two points of terminal gravity. <laughs> we find it on day seven with some biofine to drop the yeast out. Oh, okay. On day eight, harvested the yeast, kegged the beer. Man, okay. So yeah. That's the program.